If you've ever found yourself wondering, why is there so much suffering and evil in the world? I've got good news for you. You're not alone. I think all of us think about that sometimes. In fact, even the Bible writers and characters in the Bible sometimes ask those same questions that we find ourselves asking. Notice here on the screen, put some verses up. Jeremiah 12, verse 1, Why has the way of the wicked prospered? And why are those who deal in treachery at ease? God, tell us. Why has the Lord done all these things to us? Jeremiah 5, 19. What about Jeremiah 13, 22? Why have these things happened to me? Why am I suffering? God. Malachi 2, 17, Where is the God of of justice. These aren't skeptics who are asking. These are believers saying, God, what's going on in our world? What about this one? Psalm 10, verse 1. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Unless you think it was just the less spiritual characters of the Bible who sometimes asked why. Even Jesus hanging upon the cross Matthew 27, 46 said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are real questions that we all ask. And you don't have to look far. In fact, it's in our news. You can't escape it. You want to see what's going on in the world, and you're overwhelmed with feelings of sadness and sorrow and frustration and questions. Why is this going on? If it wasn't already clear to you that there's suffering in your own life and the lives of your family members and friends. Before we start, I I do have a few disclaimers. We're going to be talking about this topic for the next four weeks. It's a big topic, so there's a lot of ways that we're going to address it and think about it. But I want to admit from the very beginning, I probably can't answer all your questions. I wish I could, but I probably can't. Hopefully, you're going to find some things that are helpful. If you miss a week, you can always catch up on YouTube, where we'll post each presentation. But it's also important to remember from the outset that if you are suffering or if you know someone's suffering, it seems like sometimes our tendency to try to help other people is to give them answers. Like, oh, well, there's a reason for everything. Now I'll feel better. When someone's suffering, what they need is love, not answers. What they need is compassion and someone to cry with them and sit with them in their time of sorrow and grief. So today, I I, I can't answer the specific questions you might have in your own life, but hopefully we'll provide a framework today and over the next several presentations that will help you process better. If God is so good, why is the world so bad? Having said all this, let's begin with a word of prayer. God, I am grateful this morning uh, that you love us, and I truly believe that. In spite of the, the questions that we may have at times, Lord, you have poured out your love to us in so many ways, and for that we say thank you. But as we talk about this important subject, I pray that you will uh, enlighten our minds and give us a better understanding of you and your character and the world that we live in. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Christians generally believe that, among other things, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and that God is also sovereign. He's in control. But if you look at the news, and you see the suffering and feel the suffering in the world, this poses what seems like a problem. Because how could God be all good and all powerful, people reason and question, and yet the world look like the way it does? Surely, he would prevent such horrendous pain and suffering, people reason. Given the the world's present state, many people who think about this topic, they just conclude, well, if that's how God is, then there must not be a God, or if there is a God, there's not a God that's worth knowing. And while the reality of suffering and evil has caused many to lose faith, 
there actually has been a really good answer, at least to part of the question, for almost 2,000 years. It goes all the way back to the early Christian church fathers and theologians. And it's called, as you may have heard of it, the free will defense. Essentially, it says in, in the simple version that God grants all of his creatures free will, freedom to choose. Therefore, he can't force his creatures to do the good things that he desires. And sadly, many times the creatures freely choose to do the evil that he does not desire them to do. But because he's given this gift of freedom, he, he's unable to override their free will. Um, he doesn't take back the gift that he has given. And so suffering results because of this. Uh, so evil on the understanding of the free will defense is largely a result of the misuse of free will. Like I said, this has been around for a long time, but it's been developed and honed and, and improved, um, especially and most notably by the, the Christian philosopher Alvin Plantinga. Um, in fact, his presentation of the free will defense is so powerful that Christian philosophers and even atheist philosophers, a number of them, say this answers the logical problem of evil. It resolves this problem. Notice here on the screen, we're going to take a look at a quote here by William Rowe. Uh, in his life, he was a leading atheist philosopher, and he summed it up by saying this, the logical problem of evil has been severely diminished, if not entirely resolved, as a result of Plantinga's work. Uh, elsewhere, Rowe noted uh, the following. He said, some philosophers have contended that the existence of evil is logically inconsistent with the existence of the theistic God. No one, I think, has succeeded in establishing such an extravagant claim. In other words, while he's an atheist, he says, yeah, it's logically possible that God can exist and also suffering at the same time. And it's not just William Rowe. There are others. You can note uh, the words of the atheist philosopher J.L. Mackey. He said, we can concede that the problem of evil does not, after all, show that the central doctrines of theism, that's you know, the belief in God, are logically inconsistent with one another. You'll notice uh, these philosophers talk about the logical problem of evil. That's just trying to square the logical and, and philosophical question of can a good and loving and all-powerful God exists, and at the same time there be suffering and pain and evil in the world. And these philosophers and others, even though they're not Christians, say, yeah, I guess it can. It doesn't prevent this obstacle that's insurmountable like we first thought. So if the free will defense for God and suffering is true, or at least helpful in the conversation, it's important to ask the question, well, why would free will be so important that God would give it to us at risk of all the pain and suffering that may accompany it. And that's where we move from logic to feeling in our lived out experience. Why is free will so important? You've probably heard about C.S. Lewis, the great Christian author and theologian. Notice what he said on this very exact question. He said this, free will is what made evil possible. Why then did God give free will? Notice his answer. He says, because free will, although it makes evil possible, is the only, also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. So if you want to have love and joy and, and relationships truly worth having, you have to have free will, he argues. A world of automata, of machines or robots, of creatures that worked like machines, would hardly be worth creating. He concludes by saying, the happiness which God designs for his higher creatures is the happiness of being freely, voluntarily united to him and to each other. And for this, for that, they must be free. Not only does C.S. Lewis argue that free will is essential to the life and love that we seek and strive for in this world, uh, but the Christian theologian and philosopher and also my former professor, John Peckham, in his book, Theodicy of Love, which if you're a deep thinker and you, 
we won't cover all the questions, but if you're a really deep thinker and don't mind chewing on some deep concepts, you should get his book, The Odyssey of Love. But here's what he has to say. He noted that the free will defense is strongest when the value that is offered as the morally sufficient reason or the justification for God's allowance of evil is not moral freedom alone, but rather what? Love. Love. He continues, he says, which I take to be a greater good, perhaps even the greatest good in the universe, if indeed God is love, as 1 John tells us, what value could be greater? I think we all intuitively know this. To truly experience authentic love, it has to be free. And love requires that freedom, but freedom entails some risk, doesn't it? If you've ever tried to date someone or dated somebody, you know that that's a risky business. Amen? <laughs> so some broken hearts. We could share stories at, at our healthy luncheon after church about <laughs> the risk that you experienced. Uh, you know, I remember when I took the chance to get to know Sarah, my wife, currently, and always. I said that because you may not know. Some of you may be visiting today, and you don't know that I'm married to someone named Sarah. <laughs> oh, boy. That was a close one. Always and forever. So when I took a chance to get to know Sarah, we were both uh, at Andrews University, and it was abundantly clear that if the relationship was going to work, it would have to be freely entered into, not forced. We met uh, there at the campus of Andrews University, downstairs in the financial department in the ad building. I was leaving, I, had, I was in front of her in line, and I recognized her because I knew her sister and, and so forth, and, and I said a few words to her, and she just had to turn in a piece of paper, so we ended up walking up the stairs and uh, out the building and down the sidewalk together. Uh, and that was where it all got started. But imagine if instead of just general conversation, if I had pulled out of my backpack, which must have been very big, a large machete and said, all right, Sarah, I'm going to need you to give me all your money. Could she have done that? Being threatened with a, with a machete, could she have given me her money? At least the, the cash that she had on hand, which wouldn't have been much, you know, poor college students, grad students. Uh, she could have done that. If I had said, get on the ground now, could she have done that? Yeah, there's only two people here. Yes, they, she could have. Imagine you're approached by a mugger, and they have a gun. Could you obey the order to get on the ground? Yeah. Y y unless you're so paralyzed by fear, you would do it. Now, what if I had said instead, I want you to love me and marry me. Could she have done that? She could have married me, but she never would have loved me, right? Never would have. Is that right, honey? The kids weren't feeling great today. She's, she, they're watching at home uh, the live stream. It's obvious to us that love, for it to be anything that's actually love, it has to be freely received and freely given and not forced. So God, who is love, when he made creatures in this wonderful universe, he created them with the capacity to actually love, truly love. And then also the option to not love, to obey and not to obey, to serve and not to serve. To do that, he gave us a significant amount of freedom. He could have made us all robots, could have made us really realistic looking robots, uh, today, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, uh, and it's quite useful for certain things. Um, in fact, we already use it in certain ways you probably didn't even realize. Uh, but just this last week, I asked ChatGPT, which is one of the most popular AI interfaces online, I asked a couple questions. I said uh, the following. I said, do you love me? We'll put it on the screen here. Do you love me? This is ChatGPT 3.5. 
And the response came back, I'm just a computer program, so I don't have the capacity to love or have emotions. My purpose is to provide information and answer questions to the best of my knowledge and abilities. If you have any questions or need information, feel free to ask, and I'll do my best to assist you. What was the answer? In short, no. So then I asked a follow-up question. But Yes, but are you capable of love? Could you love? No, I am not capable of love or any other emotions. I am a machine learning model created by OpenAI. And I lack consciousness. Emotions are subjective experiences. I can provide information, answer questions, and engage in conversations, but I do so based on patterns in the text I was trained on and not on any personal feelings or emotions. That's pretty smart, and it's just a machine. It's just a, it's just a program spitting back information based upon its complex analysis of language and patterns and input from its programmers. You know, I, I read an article a number of years ago about a woman in France who got engaged, not to a human, but to a robot. She was very happy, and she concluded by saying, you know, love is love, and I love this robot, and we have a genuine love experience together. I mean, it, it's hard to read this article and just not grab your hair and say, what is she doing? Because we all know, I hope we all know, that's not real love. Real love cannot be programmed. It doesn't work. It will never work. Even as AI and computers and robots get more realistic seeming. So when God created humans and, and creatures in the universe, he gave them the capacity to enjoy loving relationships with one another, and that requires authentic freedom. But here's an important point that must be made. Just because freedom uh, involves the possibility of evil, that in no way means that freedom requires evil. So when God created the universe and gave us freedom and the opportunity to love, he was not therefore necessarily creating evil. It wasn't required. There could have been a perfect universe with no suffering and no evil and total freedom, and we would have all been much happier for it. Merely, it's just the opportunity or the potential for evil that comes along with freedom. Notice what Richard Rice had to say about this topic. He said, God is responsible for the possibility of evil, but not the actuality of evil. Creatures who misuse their freedom are entirely to blame for that. Okay, but we continue, and you, you might think, all right, so there's freedom and, uh, and the ability to love, but couldn't God just prevent all murders? I mean, wouldn't that be awesome? And if he prevents all murders, I mean, we might as well uh, not stop there. Let's stop war. All wars. And we might as well stop conflict because that leads to war and harsh words, that, fighting and bickering, because that leads to greater conflict. And if we're doing that, we might as well stop raping and stealing and lying and, and all those sorts of things, because those can be involved in war and conflict also. And pretty soon, there's zero freedom or next to no freedom. True love requires true freedom. And true freedom means that people can choose otherwise than God would ask them and want them to choose. Some people think, well, couldn't uh, an all-powerful God simply create creatures that would only freely choose to follow him and to love? Notice what Richard Swinburne, the theologian, says. He, he would say, no, it's logically impossible that God could give us such free will and yet ensure that we always use it in the right way. Because free will, by definition, allows the opportunity for it not to be free. I remember when I was younger, I was playing a card game with my sister. Anyone ever play the game Rook? Okay. I was playing with my sister. She went to go out of the room for a few minutes, and I took the opportunity to deal myself the absolute perfect hand. <laughs> there was no way I could ever lose with a hand like that, and there was no way that I did, <laughs> because I totally crushed her. And after I crushed her in this game, enjoying my victory. Do you think I was enjoying it like I would have had I done it honestly? No. 
Even if it were possible for God to stack the deck of the universe, he wouldn't because God is so authentic and so loving that he would never work in a way that is manipulative in that sort of way. Now, with all this talk about free will, I recognize that not everybody believes that free will is even possible. Uh, And there are Christians and non-Christians alike who who would uh, disagree on whether free will is possible. So I want to take a brief look um, whether the Bible even teaches that free will is possible for us to have. And I know there are a lot of different definitions of what free will is, but in essence, uh, if one affirms that free will is possible, we're not saying that free will is unlimited. I am bound by the laws of gravity and nature and cause and effect. My free will is not limited. It would be fun to fly around the room and fly to Mars without a spacecraft. I can't do that. Uh, But God has given us significant free will. I could be imprisoned and not able to move a muscle, but I could still use my mind and I could still will and think otherwise than those externally from me would want me to. Uh, But what does Scripture teach? Do we have any sort of free will? And it would be easy for me to rattle off verses like from Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. Uh, But friends from other Christian churches with a Calvinistic perspective would rattle off other verses, and they would say, see, this cancels out your verses. And so it's easier actually to ask a logically prior question rather than do humans have free will. But a better question, I think, to ask is, Does God always get what he wants? Or does God have any unfulfilled desires? Because the answer to that question will determine whether or not humans are able to act freely in some significant way. Now, how how could this be? How could God have unfulfilled desires if God is all-powerful? And the reality is, if God makes a promise to do something or not to do something, he is limiting himself. If he says, I will not do X, then he won't do X because his character of love, and he he doesn't break promises, uh, prevents him from breaking that promise or that covenant. Uh, And so when God gives freedom to humanity, he's not simply going to revoke all that freedom because he is limiting himself by the the free choices that he makes as our all-powerful and sovereign God in order that love might be furthered. Uh, And notice a few examples of this in Scripture. Put a few verses on the screen here. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. The Bible says, Yet the Lord longs to be what? Gracious to you. Therefore he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. But just three verses earlier, notice what it says. That's what God longs for. But this is what it says before. This is what the Sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says. In repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have what? None of it. God longs to be gracious. He longs to give us rest. But the people in that day said, we don't want it. Unfulfilled desires from God. Matthew 23, 37, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jesus said, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks, under her wings, but you were what? Not willing. Did Jesus force the people to come to him? He gave them the option, even though they turned away. What about Luke? Luke 7, verse 30. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. They rejected God's purpose for themselves. They had the option to reject it. What about 1 Timothy 2? This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be what? Saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Question. Does the Bible teach that everyone will be saved? Sadly, many will reject. God's desires unfulfilled. 2 Peter 3, 9. This is The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to what? The perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. God desires everyone to be saved. He desires everyone to accept the free gift that that Maddie uh, demonstrated this morning. 
but sadly not everyone will. And so what we have is a scripture showing, not because God lacks power, but because God respects the free decisions, the moral choices of his creatures. He allows them to do things otherwise, uh, other than what he would want for them in the ideal sense. Now, this next quote is, is a little complex, uh, but we're going to work through it together. Notice what John Peckham says um, in regards to this. He says, whereas determinism, and that just means there's no free will, everything is cause and effect, and there's no opportunity to choose. Determinism doesn't adequately account for God's unfulfilled desires in Scripture. So it doesn't make sense if you read the Bible believing that God chooses everything for everyone and there's no free will. Verses like that don't make sense. Uh, and then there's some people who believe that there's free will, but they believe it in a little different sort of way, and they can't understand... Uh, and account for the strong biblical statements of God's providence or the way that he works in the world. So there's these different ways that have a hard time of understanding all of what scripture teaches on the topic. He says the distinction between God's ideal and remedial wills allow both texts to speak without muting each other. In other words, in God's ideal will, there would be no sin. There would be no suffering. Everyone would have freedom and love, but nobody would ever choose against his will. Now, that's not the world that we live in. And so there's God's remedial will, his remedy, his will based upon the present circumstances, which is that everyone accept the gift of Jesus. Uh, now, even with that will, not everyone will accept that, but he's provided opportunity for all to be saved. So understanding that there are different levels to the will, this ideal will versus these are the realistic circumstances we're in, and so this is what my will is for now. When you understand that, God indeed does whatever he pleases, as scripture affirms, but he also is not always pleased by what occurs. Because part of what pleases him is to respect for the sake of love the free decisions of creatures, which often displease him. God's ideal desires are often fulfilled, but he will nevertheless bring about his ultimate remedial purposes. Even though God has desires that are unfulfilled, even though he wishes all would be saved, he's going to save as many as he can, and it will be amazing and fabulous in his heavenly kingdom. Amen? So we can best understand the teachings of Scripture when we understand that there's a God of love who's given us freedom, given us the opportunity to love, but that we have misused that gift of freedom in ways that, that go against God's ideal desires for us. And he has, in some ways, limited his own actions so that love and true freedom can flourish. I imagine that this is somewhat analogous to a parent of a teenager where the kids are starting to reach that age where they have to make decisions for themselves. And up to this point, as parents, you've made all the decisions, I mean the important ones, and then you reach a point where the kid have, kids have to choose for themselves. And you as a parent have to limit yourself because you can no longer make those choices. It's not healthy for you to make all the choices for your kids their entire lives. And so you wish that they would only always do good things all the time. And you have unfulfilled desires as parents, even as your kids will sometimes make choices other than what you wish. So as we wrap up for today, where does this leave us? What have we learned today? Briefly in review, we've seen that the free will defense provides a logical, it's logically possible for God to exist, but for there also to be suffering in our world. We've seen that God is a God of love, and he gave his creatures the highest and greatest gift, which is the gift of love, which requires freedom, which also involves the potential uh, for evil. Finally, we've seen that God respects the freedom that he has given to us, even though it means that sometimes and often his ideal desires are not fulfilled. The story's been told about a forest fire um, or not a forest fire, uh, well, it was a forest fire um, in western Canada 
and it ended up burning down this farmer's farmhouse. As the embers cooled, he was walking over his property, just really devastated by everything that's happened, poking around with a stick, trying to see if anything uh, survived. And he sees a burnt lump on the ground, and as he looks at it, he realizes it's one of his hens uh, that has been charred. And he flips it over with the stick that he's holding, and out from underneath it come three little baby chicks, still very much alive. And he saw that in those intense moments, that mother hen had protected her children, um, had given up her life in order that her children, uh, her chicks, might have the opportunity to live and to be free. Kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? We have a God who is not unaware of what it's like to suffer. When you go through something, God feels it in his heart also. When Jesus hung on that cross, it was because we misused the gift that had been given to us from him. And so he was paying the ultimate consequence so that through his sacrifice and through his suffering, he might once again provide us the opportunity to choose and to love again. Not only to live and love and, and be free in this world as it presently is, but that we might have the opportunity in the world to come to live and love for all eternity in a place with no suffering, no death, no evil. I want to go there someday. How about you? I want to be a part of that world to come. You know, today we've only scratched the surface of this topic. I don't claim to even have answered half of your questions, many questions unanswered. Next week we're going to talk a little bit more. Why are there natural disasters? Uh, why is there simply so much evil, even given what we've talked about, and many others? I look forward to seeing how we can better understand this important topic next week. So I hope you'll join us uh, online or in person next week. As we close, let's bow our heads for a word. Loving Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll continue to enlighten our minds to give us understanding on this important topic. And Jesus, we are so thankful that you didn't leave us in this world to suffer alone, that you came down and suffered with us and on our behalf so that someday we can all uh, live and enjoy that perfect world made new again. This is our prayer and this is our hope and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen.